Welcome to the Building Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Austin Tunnell. Today, I have on Ruben Hassan, um, who is a Dutch podcaster and YouTuber and founder of the Aesthetic City Podcast, which you may have heard of because he's got a few kind of viral YouTube hits. Um, he, he, Ruben studied urban planning in Amsterdam and then urbanism in Delft. And, and after a short time co-founding a VR company, he actually worked for a few years as an engineer. And then in 2021, he decided to go off on his own and start full-time this Aesthetic City podcast, which is, is pretty cool, exciting. And the, the mission of the Aesthetic City is to foster the creation of beauty and true sustainability in architecture and urbanism through the advocacy for local, timeless, traditional, and human-centered design principles and traditions, which I think is really beautifully said. Um, so since 2021, he's launched the podcast and YouTube video, and he's got a couple really great videos that have kind of gone viral from uh, his his video on the city of Kayala in Guatemala. And then also, I'm going to mess this up, uh, Le, Pessis, uh, Robinson, uh, Le Pessis Robinson outside of Paris, which is a really remarkable story and just a, a wonderfully done video. It's only 13 minutes. Highly recommend you listen to it. Um, Real quick, just to tell you what we get into today. So one, I, I we talk about his transition from engineer to, you know, filmmaker and being self-employed. Um, we talk about what life is like in, in Amsterdam and what building and development is like in Amsterdam today and what we can learn from that here in the United States. We talk about this idea of gentle density and what we mean by that and how that's different than, say, more apartment um based cities like Paris and Vienna and some of the rest of, of Europe and how, once again, we can learn some things for the United States here. And then also talking about beauty and why beauty matters. Um, and let's see, we talked about uh, just even even young versus old people. We talked a little bit about Dutch farmers and the Dutch farmer protests. And then also why we both have a lot of hope for the future. So I really hope you enjoy the conversation. It was fun. Uh, please like, subscribe and share. And I'll see you next time. Ruben, thanks so much for coming on the podcast with me. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, for for having the opportunity to being on. Yeah, I, I would like to actually start with a quote that uh, you said on September 7th, 2021. You said, uh, it took me some time to start realizing that I am currently in the best disposition to start a new chapter in life. I'm working at an engineering firm, but I'm going to create the time the time to work full time on the issue of improving our built environment. And I think that's pretty cool because I was just like looking at your website again because it'd been a while and I found that and I was like, wow, it's been two and a half years since you did that. You know, and that's a pretty extreme jump. Yeah. Like, hey, I'm an engineer to suddenly I'm a podcaster and filmmaker. <laughs> so can you talk about that transition and not just, oh, the facts of it, but like the emotional and mental state of going through that transition and then Two and a half years later, look at where you are. What is that like? And, you know, you talk about that some more. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, two and a half years. It's, it's, it's kind of crazy how fast time went. Um, yeah. So um, I was I was really uh, I think it was still in the end of the, the COVID days. Uh, things were starting to get a little bit more normal again, but still there were uh, measures. Um, but I was I was bored out of my mind. Uh, first of all, uh, well, I, it just I, I didn't do something that really resonated with what I found very important. Uh, but the funny thing is that I only later found out like, fully. Like when you're in something and it doesn't really feel right, you feel like something is not fully uh, okay. But only when you really uh, change something about it, you later realize how strongly that is true, unless you have this big uh, kind of moment of insight where, where you really uh, discover where you're doing this. Post. So, um, yeah, um, let me think it was, it was a very, um, at first it was very exciting because I had the opportunity to, to do this for a while. I could pay myself out for a little bit to take a bit of a take a little bit of an, um, yeah, uh, time off and do something different. Uh, and I think I was kind of naive as well at first, just trying it out, uh, see what I could make from it. And I didn't really even have a really good plan. I think that's not really the best advice for anyone to do this, 
but it was, but, it was. Um, but somehow I felt like this is going to work out some, some way. And I get a very, very good faith in that this, that, that it would turn out into something. Um, and I kind of just started, well, making a podcast and, uh, and of course also my idea about what the Islamic city would become wasn't really formed yet. It was kind of still vague. I, I was, I also had this uh, idea in mind to kind of, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to first find out what was happening. Uh, and then that kind of quest and search for, to see what was happening became, um, yeah, I, I just kind of translated all the, all my findings into posts, into, well, podcasts. And I mean, the podcasts were just kind of the final non process, but just interviewing experts basically. Um, and that became the aesthetic city. Um, and I think the, the YouTube channel, that was kind of the first, also the, the first, um, uh, yeah, effort to, to see like, could, could I also, well, make this into my job somehow and actually earn a living with it. And that was also an extremely big uh, risk I took. I mean, how many people can actually earn money at, at some realistic time frame in some realistic time frame with YouTube? So uh, that was also something that just kind of magically paid off. So I feel it is a bit of an outlier in some ways. Uh, but I, I also feel like if there's a will, there's a way. But sometimes I can't really explain why. Uh, why it succeeded <laughs> that sounds yeah, a logical doll yeah no it's super cool because you can actually hear it, uh in your voice as you're trying to explain it it's a little hard because like you said you didn't have a fully formed plan but yeah. i relate to that because you know i was an accountant and then that same experience what you're talking about just that feeling inside something's wrong but you don't know what you don't know what i i didn't know what i wanted that's why i went off to the peace corps because i was like maybe the the un or i i don't know foreign service or something you just have to to go and i i really like that part of your story um and the more people i talk to the more i realize i don't think anyone when they when they go to step out into a new path like yeah. no one has it figured out it's all just kind of like yeah. let's step out and see what happens and recalibrate um so very cool to just see how quickly that's happened for you and 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 some of the success you've you've had so very very cool yeah and and it's it's funny that you were one of my first podcast guests actually uh yeah I mean, not really late after beginning but i already came on to your your project pretty early and uh it was just exactly uh, in line with the things that i saw in the world that were really uh, hopeful so, um, and I think that's also why, uh, for example, the videos took off so well, because that's what people really need the most, which is kind of a bit of hope. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good way to, uh, to put it. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you studied urban planning in, in Amsterdam and urbanism in Delft, uh, which by the way, uh, just kind of coincidence here, but one of my favorite paintings is Vermeer's The Little Streets, which is oh, yeah. that Ella House in Delft. Do you know which painting I'm talking about? It's this old yeah, stepped yeah, yeah. gable, see little cracks in the brick, and it's so simple and plain. And I just love, I've, I read this, I'm not that smart. I just read this in North Atlantic Cities by, by Charles Duff, and he talks about, um, yeah, how the Dutch really celebrate um, the, the ordinary, the everyday beauties. It's not necessarily just the big things, it's finding beauty in the simple, ordinary, everyday things. And I just, love that and i feel like that picture embodies that and actually our first structural masonry house in oklahoma city is, is modeled after the house if you look at mm -hmm. our house in wheeler district and that one the stepped gable like that's actually the inspiration for it um but anyway sorry that was a bit of an yeah. aside but um so talking about your aunt's experience in urban planning and and, and urbanism in delft you know the dutch cities are, are kind of known just to be some of the most beautiful and pleasant cities in the world but you know, in your in in your work, and even in your your first blog post, you kind of lay out, "Hey, here's what's wrong with construction and development today." And it sounds like you're describing America when you the United States when you're talking. And so I'm curious: Are you talking about the Netherlands? And and really, what is the difference between what were cities like, you know, being built like? What are the historic centers like? And then what is happening today in you know over where you are? Um. Yeah, so um, I think there's problems everywhere, uh, of course. And I think the problems in the United States are far bigger than in, in, in Europe, for example, uh, because 
I mean, it, it's it's kind of different sets from. So I think in the United States, there's a there's more of a, a, a kind of a yeah, the entire urban model isn't working. Kind of it's it's built on yeah, urban sprawl, uh, automobile suburbs, and uh, it's yeah, like what what Strong Towns is saying. It's not it's not a financially sustainable model and it, it, it can't endure on the long term. So and it's really expensive to fix that because you need to redensify. But it's also a cultural problem because you yeah, Americans want well, I want my yard, I want my uh, my own home, I want the car in front of the door. Uh, it's kind of yeah, ingrained with the American way of life. So but yeah, it's physically it's it's not it's not sustainable. So it's something that yeah, it will probably sooner, yeah, at some point it will not be able to be sustained unless we get unlimited free energy or something. Um, and, and I don't know, like ways to really cheaply fix all the, all the, the facilities it needs, but in, in the United, uh, so that's the United States. And I think those problems are huge. There might be solutions. Um, and I think new urbanism is of course, one of them. Um, and there you have in the Netherlands, you have, uh, we have amazing public transport, for example, and cycling infrastructure, but we're a very compact country with a mild climate. So everything works in our favor, uh, on that end. So we kind of have the right ingredients for, uh, urban design, but then what the problem is in the Netherlands is that we, uh, we have lost, uh, kind of the urgency and the sense and this also the sense of beauty and the urgency to build and build beautiful things and to build things that are actually uh, future proof because and that that's something that's actually international um we're building buildings that will be torn down in 50 years uh apartment blocks that are yeah so ugly that they will turn into slums into a couple of decades um neighborhoods that have no, yeah, no other functions, but just living there and, uh, and, or are just extremely stark and people don't want to go there. We don't build places where we want to go and those places will not survive. Uh, because yeah, that's, that's one of the things, uh, which I now really strongly believe in. It's not, it's not only, uh, it's really essential to build places people want to go to because that will make them sustainable in the long term. Because they will, yeah, only this will people will want to be will support commerce and will support uh, communities that want to live there and not like slide down over time into places that nobody wants to live. So, um, and that's something that happens everywhere. And that's also what happens in the Netherlands. And then you have, of course, uh, maybe another theme is just building things that completely detonate in the existing uh, historical urban fabric. So, completely disrespecting, uh, for example, the, the urban fabric of Amsterdam and the typologies and the architecture of Amsterdam or of Utrecht or Groningen or whatever, um, which is also something that happens in other European countries. We see this everywhere where they just disrespect what is, what stands in Venice or in Paris or just name a city. Um, so, and a lot of people are done with that. So, um, yeah, although we might have solved Kind of the, the urban puzzle, perhaps, and even there, I mean, it's not always perfect. Uh, we have those challenges still, and I think in the United States, perhaps it's even an opportunity to to build uh, yeah, kind of completely new places which do everything right, but fixing what is really there is the hard because that's extremely expensive as well, and yeah, uh, just challenging also uh, legally and. Yeah, no other fronts. Yeah, so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's such a good, good in. It's such a good insight of we have to build places that people want to go and be. Uh, you know, I've started referring to to places that are not like that. Like that, that you're you were, you were trying to, to to describe apartment complexes that just are completely lifeless. I'm just starting to refer to those things as sleeping facilities, you know, neighborhoods, yeah. I, na quote unquote neighborhoods, they're not neighborhoods, you know, they're, Human storage. they're sleeping facilities, right? And it's not that, uh, it's not that the people that live there are, you know, they might even like their neighborhood. It's not like you're trying to be mean about anything. It's just that um, most people don't have a choice because we're just 
building, you know, a very tiny group of people, tiny, tiny, tiny builds something for the 99% for everyone. You know, it's like, uh, uh, the, there was this article he was talking about, if you were to blast just music across your whole city, you would really want that music to be beautiful and, yeah. and easy to listen to and yeah. kind of like largely agreed upon of like, yeah, this is the music that we're about want to listen to. You know, you don't actually yeah. want just novelty and shock and something so brilliant that only a few percentage of people appreciate. So anyway, mm -hmm. I think that's a really insightful thing. And, you know, I, yeah. I want to talk a little bit more about in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam, because you're in Amsterdam, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, what is, you know, you, you compared and contrasted a little bit the United States to the Netherlands, but I, wouldn't, I wonder if you could talk to me a little bit about the day-to-day -day life in the Netherlands about, you know, for example, how do people get around? How do, mm -hmm. what is life like for kids and elderly people in specific? Because we get a lot of questions about that. The moment you say something besides endless suburban sprawl, they're like, but what about the elderly people, you know? And yeah. they're like, well, actually, I think it's a lot better for elderly people in an integrated. And then also physical and mental health and, and just kind of the attitude of people around. Yeah, just talk a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, but that's really, really nice one. So uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm just going to focus on kind of my own experience because uh, I'm very much someone who is used to take the bike and public transport. I don't even have a car. I live in Amsterdam. I live pretty near uh, like a little, yeah, uh, you could call it kind of a public transport hotspot. So you have a little train station, uh, which is kind of a station that's situated on part of the, the ring of railways that circles around uh, the city of Amsterdam. Uh, and there's also uh, an, a tram stop. There's bus stops. Um, and if I well cycle for a little bit, I can also come to like a to to a metro stop actually, uh, or just take one one stop by train. So it's extremely well connected if you're in the right places. That's of course kind of rare. Not everybody has like all those modalities in the same place. But um, if you live in Amsterdam, there's a big chance you'll have either a metro, a tram, uh, or train station quite nearby, or at least within uh, a short well cycle trip. Uh, near my so you can get on a on a on a on a train for example pretty rapidly and then it's pretty easy to get to another city where uh, the last mile problem has also be, been kind of solved unless you need to carry heavy stuff uh, with public transport bikes which is basically just a huge garage uh, filled with bikes which you can kind of rent with a with a little nfc uh, public transport car cart you just take a bike, you check out uh, or check in, you use the bike, uh, they automatically deduct the money for that bike off your account after a couple of days. And then you come back and you, uh, well, you tap your card again and you deliver the bike. And so, so that's a wonderful system. And it's like one of the biggest breakthroughs, I believe, in public transport and analysis. But of course, you have people who live a bit further out, who live in like, more like suburb uh, municipalities where they need a car to go to the job. So we still have traffic jams. We still have a lot of car traffic. We love, we have a lot of people working, of course, uh, with, with their fans. And, um, but even those will sometimes just get the bike to go to a shop or to something nearby, uh, because everything is pretty closer. And in most places you'll be able to do quite a bit by bike and there is, uh, even in those places where some people will live who do everything by car, um, you will have people who will do most by bike. <laughs> and with electric bikes, that gets even better because, well, your, your, your uh, what is it? Uh, action radius is, is much bigger. Hmm. You can get much farther with it without getting tired. So in, uh, for example, the, um, uh, let's say uh, rural areas, School children will often have an electric bike so they can go for, well, miles to their schools by bike. And actually for how, children, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, how old does that start? Because I saw something once about like kids getting trained, like they start getting trained in like the public school system at like four years old. Is that true? Yeah, or how does... yeah that's true. I think like wow, I was you... like three, four years, five years uh, when I was put on like a little kind of, kind of a mini mini uh kind of a, a bicycle not a tricycle uh 
Um, I think before that, of course, on like a try screen, then they put you on like a little, uh, 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 what is it, um, bike with, with training wheels. At some point, they, they take the training wheels off and then you're kind of expected to just go to school by bike. And, and then like, how old are kids going to school by bike? Uh, well, I the think youngest now, you would see. The youngest, I think like um, before their teens, um, I think like often nowadays things are changing a bit because uh, everybody is getting more, you know, afraid. You have more helicopter moms. That's a trend that's also happening here. Mm. But I think still like in, in the countryside, I think children uh, from, I think starting with like six, seven or eight years. Okay. I, I can I can say, but the point is, it's really safe. Like we don't have a lot of traffic accidents here because we have a completely separated, or well, in most places, a completely separated um, uh, cycling infrastructure. So cycling roads, which are separated from the normal roads, and all the uh, car drivers, they know that there will be cyclists. So they expect cyclists, they respect them, and they will take distance. Uh, so it's completely different from culture on the roads as well. Yeah. And, you know, it's amazing because you talk about what life can be like in the proximity of things, but, you know, Amsterdam is not, and, and most Dutch cities, they're, they're not skyscraper cities. We're not talking Manhattan. We're not even talking 15, 20 story buildings, right? Most of these stories are kind of yeah. around five. Is that, yeah. am I right about that? Yeah, well, except for Rotterdam, which tries to be uh, some yeah. sort of a, a New York, but that's really, uh, uh, yeah, that's a different one. Well, nowadays, of course, there's more and more apartment buildings getting taller and taller, uh, and they, like developers, try to squeeze every last penny out of their their land. So we're seeing it much more often that we get like 60, 70 meter, so that's like, yeah, 20, 30 floor buildings mm. up to 20, yeah, sometimes taller, sometimes they're really start building towers but the general urban yeah. fabric um in the inner cities of the netherlands are yeah four or five stories in the netherlands. in amsterdam it's a bit taller than utrecht for example uh because it was a bigger city and it just grew more and i think if it's really dependent on how well financially the city was doing in kind of the 17th century so it's really funny you kind of see how big the city was and how important it was and how well it grew. Uh, Leiden, for Leiden. example, is also kind of like four stories, sometimes five, sometimes three. So, um, but then if you go outside the center, we kind of, we stopped building those really dense places, um, I guess, after the 30s. And then everything became like garden cities and everything became kind of compact suburbs. So terraced housing, three stories or two, three stories um, in green areas. But um, yeah, so a bit more compact, but it was not lively. It didn't have all the functions like before. So uh, that's, that's interesting. So yeah, kind of, you can kind of see that cities is kind of, you can really see the year rings as in a tree. So you have the old historical core and then you see the, yeah, the 19th century extensions around it. Then you get the like the Garden City uh, suburbs, uh, and then you get the the post-war circles around that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I a lot of people tend to think tall, you know, and I'm very much in the four or five story or under, you know, of, of yeah. really the nicest human fabric because that is kind of the height. Of, I don't know if this where it comes from. That is kind of the height of a tree, you know, four or five stories. Yeah. Um, and so we're, we're kind of used to that scale as humans. Once you start getting 10 stories, it really creates this silo effect of light coming down. Yeah. And it's just so much bigger than you that it, it actually feels pretty inhuman. And I don't mean nothing mm -hmm. should be 10 stories. I just mean as general fabric, I really like the 45 story. And frankly, for America yeah. too, with just um, especially just most of the country, unless you're in a Chicago or Manhattan. But this more gentle density, you know, these these Dutch cities yeah. that do have a more gentle density, I think yes. they're like 17 units an acre, 20 units an acre, something like that, versus Paris is more than double that, I think, mm -hmm. um, in Vienna, because they're more like apartment building based versus your row, row home yeah. based. Um, yeah. Did you did you read the North Atlantic Cities, that book? I can't remember. If, you might not have because it was cool to me because it was talking about the Dutch builders. Um 
it, it's on my list to read. I think it, I might have it in my uh, in my on my bookshelf, but uh, it's, it's definitely on my reading list. And I think cool. it might have been um, you might have given this as a tip before. Actually. I think I might have. That's funny. It was yeah. probably because I'm talking to be like, oh, but it was so interesting because he talked about how the Netherlands really developed quite um, their architecture is different because of their culture first, as in it it developed and looks different than, you know, Paris, Vienna and, and other parts of mainland central Europe. Um, and he points out a few things that it, uh, because it was a very like strong Republic and, and weak monarchy, you know, back in the golden age in the 17th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, when it's really kind of being built on these cities and, and um, lots of religious tolerance comparatively. So you don't have as many of giant cathedrals. You don't have the same arist aristocratic class, uh, like the wealthiest, like, I can't remember the terms, but the wealth was just so much more distributed even then than just this, the hyper concentrated, you know, aristocracies of the rest of Europe who were then building palaces and then middle income people would basically build palaces and then break them up into apartment buildings. So it's really like palaces, apartment buildings yeah. and then palaces that fit next to real palaces. And then the Dutch being just, they were building homes, row homes, where people, individuals actually lived. And then the last piece that I thought was fascinating was he said the Dutch were really the first to have real residential neighborhoods because there was so much societal trust that there were shared warehouses. So rather than everyone having their shops down on the first story below their house, they actually kind of had centralized warehouses somewhere where, you know, there was actually trust between people storing things there. And then it allowed the neighborhoods to be like, this is just a row home, just a house. And that different feel that that creates than, um, you know, living on top of shops all the time. I just thought that was fascinating. Do you find any of that? Uh, do you recognize any of that? Yeah, I, I, I haven't heard. Uh, well, I can directly imagine. Uh, I should definitely read this because it's, it's super interesting. Um, just, I, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's it's a very interesting thing because also in uh, in in England they also have more terraced housing, uh, but they also have more mansion blocks. Like we really kind of uh, lack these mansion blocks for some reason. And I think it's really I do agree. It's it's a complete. It's a very cultural thing um, here in the Netherlands. It's kind of it's just like we we really expect for us like the 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 uh, let's say the Dutch dream is to have like your own little. Uh, your own little terrace house with its own back garden. Uh, it, it's not necessarily having like your own freestanding home or having you know, having an apartment. Because nowadays it's a luxury, but that's also not really something that exists in the, in the in the Dutch mind as as like a the, the the dream or the ideal kind of. So we we like our terraced homes. It's really a strong cultural concept, and that's also what they built post war in massive numbers. Yeah. I think that really. Uh, because we built so many uh, terrorist homes after the war, uh, and there's just, yeah, uh, just massive, massive, massive uh, um, increases in the amount of, of housing in, that, in those days, that I think that really cemented that culture even stronger. We already had it, but I think post, because imagine if, they, if the, the, the urban planners from after the war had decided, well, the Dutch, the Dutch workers should live in apartments, they might have changed that, I, want, uh, I think, um, but they, I guess they, they knew what the Dutch also liked and what they themselves liked. So they just planned these, yeah, huge uh, numbers of, 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 uh, of terrace house. And the funny thing is, uh, we have, we have found kind of different recipes to place, to, to build those terrace houses, uh, like all these different eras in post post-world urban planning. You see new ways of building uh, our neighborhood. So from very strict, rational uh, in like the '60s to in the '70s, where we started creating these um, very organic, cauliflower-shaped neighborhoods with with little with the one ervan actually. So the one ervan uh, concept was introduced, and then we became more formal again in the in the '80s and the '90s. Uh, so yeah, it's always it's kind of funny how that developed. That's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting too, from like, I think about, and I don't know that much, I'm not a historian, but I mean, the kind of cult, some of the cultural heritage too, is a very industrious society, like a seafaring society and commerce. And 
you know, not, um, uh, you know, King Louis the 16th is, is, is trying to kind of conquer the world. You've got all these Kings vying for power and world domination. And the Dutch are over there being like, we're building this great, beautiful, wonderful society that's, <laughs> uh, you know, through, and I mean, I don't mean it's that idealized. There was, all, there's, all, you've got the new East Indies or yeah, different companies yeah. and things that have bad reputations. I just mean, it really is quite different. And I'm pointing it out because from the, an American concept, a lot of times we think we are the most, like our heritage is the most industrious and, and there's a lot of influence from the Dutch, I, I believe on America, uh, even, um, yeah. so, so that's why I was just pointing that out. That, yeah. You, know, you talk a lot about the uh, fight for beauty. Um, yeah. And obviously that's something I talk about a lot too. Can you talk about your perspective on beauty and why it's actually important? Why is it meaningful? Why isn't it just something like nice to have? Um, and then why are we even having to have a debate about it today and your perspective? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a very good question. Um, yeah, so beauty... Um, Beauty is, is still a tough subject. So it's uh, on the you have kind of various ways to look at it. And um, I am I mean I live in here in the Netherlands, and uh, here you have extremely sober uh, kind of Calvinist people as well who who think like well all beauty is kind of luxury. Um, so that kind of reinforces that, that, that whole discussion, like why should we even talk about beauty in the first place? And we have gotten this idea. It's, we can't pay for it. it it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it's always kind of, um, uh, a bonus luxury, but well, my vision on beauty for that reason has also become kind of pragmatic to kind of show really, um, uh, yeah, by, by, by showing the, the numbers and the science that it that it's kind of a real thing it's uh, something that that we really need to uh yeah take serious otherwise um for example uh developers won't make as much money as they could uh, cities won't become as successful and and thriving so i i see beauty well uh first of all there's this scientific view of beauty which is that we know that uh we are attracted to certain kind of forms like we know that we prefer symmetry. We know we prefer curved, curved forms. We know that we uh, like some sort of detail and structure and things. We know uh, this because there's a lot of studies done to this. And we know even that some areas in our brain light up if we have an aesthetic experience, like something, either music or something we see. Uh, that's this researcher, Samir, Samir Zeki, um, who has done this research. So, um, that is, so that's the one end, but then you also, of course, also have the whole philosophical, uh, idea of beauty, which becomes much more, much harder. Um, but it's still valid. So for example, what, um, uh, what's our, our British friend again? I know you're talking about, I just forgot his name. Yeah, uh, wait, who created the film? Um, wait, I'll look for him. I might not be cute, kind of. My beauty matters. Scruton. Scruton. Yeah, Roger Scruton. Roger Scruton. Yeah. yeah. So what he wrote about it is also, of course, very, uh, yeah, important, uh, and, um, and valid, I believe, but it can't, you can't, um, convince developers with some sort, yeah, some, some poetic language Roger Scruton wrote. So that's why we need to also, uh, show it through a third way, which is patterns in lang in larger, uh, society. So looking at, uh, yeah, kind of showing what architecture is most popular. So maybe, uh, the opinion of one person is subjective. That might be true. But the opinions of a thousand people, those become a pattern and you can say something about it. And everybody who disagree, yeah, disagrees with that, just disagrees with, with, well, uh, just with solid numbers and with, with, with real things. And we know that certain are, uh, uh so certain types of architecture are more loved than others. We know that people prefer traditional architecture, for example, and that is, that comes out of every poll, every study we do. 
And then the, the, the question becomes, what makes people like that architecture, that architecture uh, better than, for example, very stark minimalist architecture? And then we return at the, <laughs> at the uh, scientific insights we have, where we see that, hey, the curved forms, the natural forms, the patterns, the detail. So everything kind of the whole, um, kind of all the different, uh, um, uh, yeah, all the different evidence uh, fits together really well in this image of what is probably more beautiful. And then the, the, the point is, yeah, uh, the most important thing is that we, we use that knowledge and that we start following that science and that we start being curious in, in, um, in, in all the studies. And then also, uh, that's the next, and that's, I think where we lack or yeah, where we, uh, which we don't have today is having the courage to undertake the project of making something beautiful because a lot of people are completely demoralized and don't believe that we either earn beauty or that we are able to create beauty or that we, um, uh, yeah, deserve beauty. <laughs> so Man. yeah, that's a big, big problem nowadays. And we need to, and, and, and the point is to, to, to build something beautiful is really aspirational. It's really, uh, and, and, and for some people, aspirations have become dangerous, have, have become, they have kind of embraced that we are going to go down as a civilization and building beauty, uh, and, and like, yeah, striving for beauty, uh, rubs them the Oops. wrong way because it doesn't fit with a worldview that everything is going down and everything will become less and less and less. And I think that's, a kind of a more, uh, a meta take on everything, but I really think that's what's happening. I think that is such a interesting and, and, and accurate, you know, from what I, what I see as well. Um, and you're right too, that, that I think, gosh, it has become so nihilistic. Like that's what I always talk about kind of the new climate movement, you know, where it's just like, yeah. it's basically hating humans. Like we just yeah. hate <laughs> humanity. Like. We, yeah. And, um, and I don't like that. That's why I always put like, it has to be about people first and then climate yes. falls under that. Cause of course, flourishing people need a flourishing world. You know, I am pretty strong yeah. on my environmentalist stuff. Um, but actually I'm a lot more concerned about mental and physical health yeah. and PFAS and all sorts of chemicals and the VOCs and how, you know, our obesity rates and diabetes and exactly. all that in the United States over like, that's going to get us actually faster than in climate change, which don't get me wrong, that is a problem. Um, but anyway, you know, you, yeah. I actually want to pick up on this because it is, there, there is this idea that, you know, one, yeah, the world is going to hell in a handbag. And then two, that beauty is somehow like oppressive because it's not inclusive because not everyone can have it to the same degree or something like that. And I would agree that beauty does take some extra means to be able to pursue because if you're strictly in survival mode, you know, food and shelter, you don't have space for beauty. Yeah. But I can also say that even in very, very, very poor societies in my own personal firsthand experience, for example, in Uganda, we would, whether we were in the town we were in, or we'd go to even more rural villages where it was literally mud huts and nothing else. And yeah. guess what? People wear Katenge fabric and wear this really beautiful, colorful fabric, right? On special things, you know, I mean, they yeah. curate their homes, even though they're mud, they sweep, they do think, you know, everyone there's something in our souls and humans it's not just about the beauty of enjoying it after the fact it's producing it and not just as an individual but as collectively as a society that's so meaningful and that's something that i i wonder about um some people crap on the the new generation or the young generation gen z's or something and don't, mm -hmm. I, I do have a question in here i'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna get there. um but, you know, I actually see this and I don't, I have not interacted with a ton of younger people. I'm 35. I've not interacted with a ton of 20 year olds lately. Um, but the, what I see is we've got a lot of broken institutions that were kind of built after World War II in particular. And those institutions changed the world order and, and in a lot of ways for the better. And we solved a lot of problems, but we also created a lot of problems and a lot of externalities that we could not see at the time. And of course we did. It's not about blaming the people back then for coming up with solutions. All you can do is do what's ahead of you, solve that problem. There's going to be yeah. more problems. 
Um, but the problem I see today is older people are trying to like hold on to those institutions because they're like, look at how good the world is. It, you should have seen how it was when we were growing up. It could be so much worse. And they're right. It could be so much worse because the modern world's a miracle. But then you've also got young people being like, the world's not working for us like it works for you. You know, we're yeah. never going to own a single family detached house on half an acre. Um, you know, and, and so I think younger people are kind of saying, that's great that the world is better than it ever has been, but we're not going to have the same opportunities as you. So we need to actually come up with new institutions to solve these new problems that were created by these old yeah, institutions. Right. And it's not about like tearing the world down. I mean, at least that's the positive aspect of it. So my question is, in the Netherlands and in your experience and people, and not just the Netherlands, people you talk to as you travel and film, do you see a real difference between kind of an older perspective and a younger perspective? And where do you think the value is of each of those perspectives in the conversation? Um, That's a very good question. Um, thinking about that, I think in the, um, in the Netherlands, I, I feel, um, there is there I've got the feeling there is less of um of a strong kind of gap between how the younger generation and the older generations uh yeah work and feel I, I do feel that um yeah because I I do believe that there is a little bit there's there's less inequality in Netherlands as well. And, and, and I think, uh, uh, our institutions are kind of still functional. Um, they're doing, they're doing, uh, not a good job, but they're, they're surviving kind of, and they're, they're still functioning. That's, that's in here in, in, um, in the Netherlands, for example, looking at architecture though, there and and actually also in nutrition for example where you have kind of a new view on things where there's new evidence which needs to be taken into account for example with nutrition about seed oils and and all other sorts of things that, that ruin your health uh, which are yeah ignored by um yeah by most mainstream doctors and and, uh, and institutions same with architecture where um well the big the status quo is not changing um and yeah all the universities are still teaching yeah an architecture paradigm which is extremely unpopular and i think is already outdated um i think for other thing yeah other institutions i'm not sure if that work is as yeah as severe i do see however however that um that uh exists like like um the, the society as it was with a lot of religious institutes um, uh, and yeah, you know, uh, 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 what is the organizations that, that were that surrounded this kind of religious um, oriented, uh, what is it? Yeah, these religiously oriented organizations, that they are in decline because the churches are getting emptier and emptier um it's the yeah you know all the organizations that are related to that for, for example uh my parents sing in a choir and yeah they have their concerts in in a church sometime but i really see when looking at the the, the audience that they are getting grayer and grayer and older and older and at some point i really think there won't be an audience be left an audience. at some point anymore. And also my parent generation is also going to be gone at some point and they're not, you know, uh, getting new people to sing in their choir. So at some point it will be gone. Like the, the church will close, uh, the choir will be gone. Uh, and there will, maybe there will be new choirs singing new types of music. But that whole thing is is dying out, and and I see that happening with some other organizations as well. But yeah, um, I think most of the young versus old nowadays is is still a bit on the internet and still a bit um, yeah yeah in in other fields. But this is not also not not really my uh, where I know most about to be honest. Mm. Uh, but this is the feeling that I get from what yeah. I see. Very interesting. 
Gotcha. This is a good next question. Um, I'm actually curious to, to, to hear your perspective on the Dutch farmers and what's mm. going on there with protests and things. And, and the reason I'm not trying to like, I'm actually not veering off course. I'm actually curious if there's any kind of connections here between kind of the mindsets that's driving that and the mindsets that's driving the built environment to my, I imagine mm. there could be some connections there. Yeah, I think the the farmers uh, that's that's also very much um, tied to the European Union and uh, their regulations for um, yeah, let's say nitrogen, because in the Netherlands at least, in other countries, uh, it's I think also about food prices, subsidies. So from what what I understand is that uh, there's a lot of anger from these farmers because um, the European Union says, uh, yeah, is on the one hand the, uh, they are changing the subsidies and they're uh, raising fuel prices. I'm not even sure if that's really true, but that's what I heard. And um, they're doing all these things. They're changing these things in the market which farmers rely on for their livelihoods and every and and i think there are also like some some perverse subsidies for example that that they are um yeah you know they're subsidizing certain foods to make sure that they're always being produced but there's way too much of it but now um but yeah i guess that gets exported it always finds some way in the market so but now they the european union seems to be um changing a lot of things that people have the feeling that they want to take the life of these farmers away, that they're kind of threatening these uh, farmers that they think we can do without those farmers. And in the Netherlands, it's actually the case because they want less farmers because uh, there's too much nitrogen, there's too much, uh, which actually endangers some types of plants and uh, some types of nature, which don't thrive with when there's a lot of nitrogen. Because nitrogen is, uh, yeah, makes plants grow, and some plants only grow well, and also species living around those plants when there is when the soil is very poor. So kind of it's kind of a struggle against a soil that gets too rich. So um, and yeah, when you have thousands, we'll give you some of, of our farms, soil. Yeah, <laughs> we'll mix some of our depleted soil in there, and you'll be good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of pig farms. So what we do, we import immense amounts of, of soy and whatnot to feed those pigs and all the nitrogen that, that started in those farms, perhaps in Brazil or I know where, maybe in the United States, comes to our pigs, they eat it, well, they poop it out, and then we have the nitrogen. But we should be shipping that nitrogen kind of back to where it came from, to the farms where all the soy was growing, to close the loop. That doesn't happen. So, uh, or issues, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, do something. Yeah. There, there should be done something with the nitrogen, I guess. But the point is they say like, okay, no, that's not the answer. We're just going to close a lot of farms. And, um, the, and this yeah, is the, the EU angry. or the Dutch government saying we're going to close a bunch of farms. It's the Dutch government, uh, right? It's the Dutch government, but they do it because there's European rule, uh, European uh. rules. But the funny thing is that just over the border in Germany, there's no problem with nitrogen, even though there's similar uh, values. Like, it's really weird. Huh. Because I remember reading something about basically the government was just saying like, yeah, we're buying your land, farmer. We're going to give you an offer and basically you can't yes. deny it. Like, and I yeah. just thought, of course, from coming from an American mindset, it was like, wow, you know, <laughs> like, don't yeah. take our land. You know, that's a pretty big uh, and you can see why there's tractors in the streets. Like how what's kind of the societal opinion of that? Is there kind of an agreed upon like, hey, that is insane. Like, is the culture, yes. the kind of Dutch culture, are they kind of for the farmers or against them? Is it split? Um, uh, does it seem as tyrannical at all? Authoritarian? Yes. A lot of people see it as tyrannical. The point is there is kind of a split between kind of the, the political and let's say intellectual elites of the country who write the newspapers, who create the news programs, who, uh, yeah, you know, report on the news from their, yeah, uh, from their kind of intellectual, you know, uh, Amsterdam chai latte, uh, positions. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the hardworking kind of farmer, regular Dutchman who see like, Hey, this doesn't this add up. They're taking farmers away. I know where my food comes from. It comes from the farmers. 
And there's a lot of sympathy for the farmers and the farmers themselves. Yeah, they see absolutely as tyranny. And I think there is something to be said for that. Um, but yeah, the, the funny thing is that a lot of the Dutchmen, uh, don't, don't agree with, with, with what the government wants for these farmers and how they're dealing with it. So the farmers party rose enormously in the polls and in the, so yeah, there is definitely a huge um uh effect in our society and uh it's getting more populist as well because of that very interesting yeah but i see the same with architecture it's it's kind of uh people have been ignoring what a lot of regular people like and i feel that's something that is also that should be uh yeah it should be done yeah it should be addressed because there is too many places in in society where, uh, yeah, where they're not really listening to the population, and I think it's because of bureaucracy. Is yeah, uh, it's also this elitism of a select few who think like we can decide this for others, and they don't show any understanding, <laughs> uh, even though they might be understanding. But and yeah, then you get terrible outcomes because we have now a, like a, what is it kind of a, a right wing populist, um, politician who won the bullet, uh, what is it? The elections in a huge way. And if today would be elections, like they would win even, even more because, uh, the ruling parties who have been in the saddle for so many years, just, they just won't listen and won't like try to understand where all this anger comes from. So yeah, it's, uh, yes. <laughs> no, that's exactly oh. what you said there. That was, I think that's really the connecting thing. I hadn't thought about it quite like that, but just that it is this, um, yeah, ignoring of normal people. And I think there's this perception yeah. that it's the intellectuals that want what we're talking about. And in some ways you have, uh, a little bit of that, but I mean, when you talk to normal people, like in, in America, there's a real statistic yeah. that came out last year from the Realtors Association that says 78, 78% of Americans say they want to live in a more walkable community and would pay more to do it. 74% wow. of, of, of Americans say they feel a sense of non-belonging in their own community. You know, it's, 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 like, it's like they're, they're telling you, and, and I mean, they're not, not, people aren't necessarily saying, Hey, we want it to look like Amsterdam, but people are saying, you know, and, and it's like these institutions that have just, um, required, this is how the rule, this is are the rules and, and yeah. it overrides the people, you know, and then the people that are enforcing those rules, like they're not even really decision makers because they're just enforcing the rules that are in place, you know, and they have a hard time, um, working around that. Um, but, but yeah, I think there is this really deep need to get back to once again. And I think it's actually what you're saying is getting back to people again. It, it's about people. It's not about yeah. the institutions. It's not about the, the, you know, the, the, the intellectual conversations about it. It's about creating a great stage for people to go out and live a rich and meaningful and vibrant and healthy and safe life. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's really, really yeah. good. Is it perhaps it's modernity, uh, which, yeah, we're starting to feel so it's estranged from, uh, yeah. So, so we, we, we let go of all these traditional, uh, ways of living, uh, ways of life, uh, and we embrace modernity and everything that came with it. But now, uh, we discover, uh, kind of the dark side of it very slowly and uh, and I think we, I mean, we, it doesn't need, it doesn't mean we need to go back to the past and repeat everything that we did, but it should at least mean that we, um, learn from the things that went well in the past and adapt those to current times. I think, mean, yeah, absolutely. Like there's this, there's this arrogance in modernity. It thinks that just like. We know everything today that we're at the height of all of human civilization and that this idea of tradition is stupid and outdated. 
and in, in my opinion, tradition is the best of innovation. Tradition was once new, right? Tradition was once modern. And then over time, it becomes a tradition because it works and it's been proven over and over and over again. And I think we have that message together, you and me, just that idea. Of, yeah, it's not about copying the past or doing something exactly like it was done 100 years ago because the world is different. But it is about building off of that knowledge that of thousands of years of human you know, tinkering and evolution of, with, with the, the built environment um, and building wonderful places for people. And we just kind of threw all that out in the past yeah. hundred years, but you know, what, uh, that you've, you know, you've been for a couple, two and a half years now, you've been traveling around talking about this. You filmed some really amazing things like Kyala and I'm going to, uh, say it, butcher it, but you know, Le Passy Robinson, Robinson outside of yeah. Paris, you know, yeah. just an amazing yeah. story of, of new construction and all that, you know, what, what gives you hope and like what, what drives you to keep doing this? Just even based on the things you've seen and the people you've met. Um, well, there's a lot of things. So first of all is, uh, our, is kind of education. It's the summer school. We organized in Utrecht, um, this year and last year, year before, which where you see, um, yeah, where you see like how how happy students uh, of architecture or just general people get when they get the chance to finally design something they really like. Um, and I'm just curious to see what would happen if we, if we um, change something in universities, for example, and we let, if we unleash all this creative power people have into a different channel, into designing with traditional classical um, principles again, because we did a, a design competition in Amsterdam uh, for this terrible thing they they built uh, on the yeah, Let's Plan, which is an important square in the city. And you see so many wonderful different designs coming out. And like, holy moly, if, if only one of those things would be built, just this, you just see the amount of creativity and skill there still is. Um, but yeah, so so it's kind of my my um, curiosity and wanting to see what comes out of that, and that's just that's something that that keeps driving me. But also um, seeing that this is a movement that is growing slowly but surely. You know, you see more, not less, new urbanist uh, environments. You see more, not less, uh, education in traditional architecture uh, springing up, being created. You see more and more, uh, well, architecture uprisings. You see more and more, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> architects, firms. Uh, it, it's a growing thing and it's developing and that's exciting. And I think we are really close to some sort of a, well, I think a paradigm shift because we have all the energy. We have, it's, it's, it's within this group where all the exciting things are happening. Modernism is, is dead. It's, it's already, they know it's dead. It's, it's sizzled out, but it, it's kind of a, kind of a zombie that keeps on walking and they, they try to try to, uh, act as if nothing is there. And then, but some architects already kind of jumping shit like Thomas Hatterwick, um, he feels something is terribly off. He started his own new, uh, yeah. What is it? Humanize, um, yeah, humanize. That's what I thought you were talking about earlier with Thomas Heatherwick. I recently ran across him. He's quite interesting. Yeah, exactly. But he is just a modernist who who is smart enough to sense that something is terribly off with modernism, uh, and he tries to do something about it. But I don't think his direction is the right one. Um, right. But anyway, uh, he still he would still be really interesting to to think to talk with and to to see what he really thinks because I haven't fully dived into what what he is uh, yeah what he's talking about. But anyway, um, yeah, there is there is so much exciting stuff happening at the moment, yeah. and um, there is just the the world is ripe for a change. Yeah. Only I feel like. Uh, all the changes coming at at once, and I'm a bit, uh, you know, nervous about the whole worldwide situation with Russia and AI and everything. It's kind of the most interesting of times. So, yeah, 
we'll see what comes out of it. We either die together or we build something really nice. Um, <laughs> I guess, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think there really are a lot of reasons to, to hope because there is, even with all the kind of bad stuff out there, things have gotten kind of bad enough in certain areas that in my opinion, it's kind of created and galvanized this counterculture. And what's cool about a counterculture is it always starts with a small group of people and it's all about relationships. Yeah. And everything else is all about institutions and, and, and rules and regulations and these non-human things. And the counterculture is all about people. And so I have, yeah. I think that's really cool. And I think it's really going to be fun to watch it unfold in, in our life and what we, what all we can get done together. Um, yeah. But I want to hear a little bit as we wrap up, uh, so yeah. just a small kind of rapid fire questions. And the first one, you know, tell 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 everyone about kind of your plans for 2024 and your upcoming trip to uh, a very special place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, this year um, I'm working on way first of all ways to Im improve my production. Um, work on a new video right now, of course, but I want to make much more videos. I'm I just I just need to find a process which is fast enough but also keeps the quality so I can say everything i want to say because i feel if i if i keep continuing in, in the the pace of last year um it won't be yeah you know it, it won't be fast enough so hopefully growing the youtube channel a lot but also as you said i'm uh, going on a nice little trip so on 30th of march i will fly to the united states of america to uh come and visit your wonderful country and see a lot <laughs> Um, I'm going to visit like 11 states or something. And I'm, I'm even thinking, well, maybe we should just come back some time and continue because there, there's, there's more stuff I want to see than I can actually, uh, visit, but I'm also going to visit you in Oklahoma. So, uh, can't wait for that. It's going to be, maybe uh, we'll do a second one of these. Yeah. In person. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah, no, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to see the, see everything there. Uh, yeah. Uh, experience America and, and not just, you know, the West coast in the camper or New York, no, yeah. New America, just Oklahoma, baby. Yeah. yeah. Come on. <laughs> I mean, I'll have to think about more... the most Oklahoma things we can do to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. I, I kind of want to also just, uh, try, try some shooting in a shooting range, for example, just really feel. Oh like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. We got, we got plenty of guns. I mean, you're, you're coming to the right place. Boy, <laughs> that's something that's got like cool. clearly what well, we have some bow ranges here, but it's, it's something you don't think about. You don't see it's just outside of our national right. kind of it's, it's and, weird and this, if you yeah. talk to people just in their in their 50s here in oklahoma so not very yeah. old in their 50s maybe mm -hmm. 60s or something they'll, they'll heck i feel like even for anyway no it would be 50 60s something like that and they talk about um going to high school and like people just had gun racks on their pickup trucks and they just had their <laughs> rifles on there. And then after school, wow. they go out to, and hunt or whatever. It's just like, oh my God, and wow. it worked. You know, you didn't hear about shootings or anything. Um, Incredible. Things, changed a bit. Well, very cool. Wow. I'm, I'm super excited about you coming here. Um, that's going to be fun. Uh, some, some kind of fun, a couple things, you know, since, since you're uh, Dutch and for anyone listening that might be interested in visiting the Netherlands. And like I said, I've been trying to get over there for a while. This whole... Uh, bus accident and being um very <laughs> difficulty walking for me is, has put a thrown a wrench in that but still you know what would be what are your what are the top cities that you would kind of recommend in the netherlands if people coming that might not be amsterdam or something because most people just think of amsterdam and drugs yeah <laughs> well, like people don't think of like uh when i say the most pleasant cities in the world i don't mean because of the drugs i mean the actual most pleasant to experience yeah. by the way Oh man, there, there's so many. The, the point is, Amsterdam is just, it's, it's actually kind of the worst place to experience true Holland and also the beautiful part of Holland. Just, just take the train to Utrecht, for example. It's like literally half an hour, 25 minutes uh, by train. It's like a direct train ride, like bam, you're in this, in your spec in the center. Just then uh, put on like blindfolds and continue to the center until you leave all the new stuff around the central station because it's, Absolutely horrendous. You're like you arrive in Utrecht, like I came for this, but just hold on, walk out of the walk through the whole shopping mall, and then you get to the city center, and then it's wonderful. And like the city is just a complete medieval pearl. Uh, the same is for same Amersfoort, for which is uh, really close as well. A beautiful medieval town. 
Leiden, which is my hometown, beautiful, uh, super walkable uh, and less destroyed, but they're, they're destroying it anyway. Um, Harlem is another beautiful, actually Harlem, uh, Amsterdam got its name from Harlem in the Netherlands. Um, man, all those cities, which are really close, really close by train, everything under an hour, um, is absolutely stunning and worth it. And you don't have to tear uh, all the tourists. You don't have all the kind of the, the gusts of weed flying. Yeah. You know, it's, it's so smelly in Amsterdam. Just everywhere you have drunk Brits, stoned Germans, uh, whatever. <laughs> and if you are in, in in Leiden or in Utrecht, you won't notice that. You're just, you're there, barely any mm. tourists. You can walk everything uh, or you get one of the bikes and you can just explore by bike. I think that that would be a really good one as well. Just get a bike and just go somewhere and just see how far you can get just uh, without finding any places where you can't really get. You can literally go to the, the harbor areas. Uh, <laughs> where normally only big trucks come, and even there they created cycling paths. It's just it's it's madness almost. Wow, wow, that's uh, pretty cool. You know, my the, our lead urban designer, building culture, Thomas Dowdy, his wife is from Utrecht. Ah, uh, nice. So yeah. uh, he, I've never been. Once again, it's it's really just very, 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 very high up on my list. Uh, but but he really loves it and. Uh, is informed by a lot of the Dutch mm -hmm. urbanism a lot because he goes over there and he was actually over there biking not, uh, I think last year. Yeah, um, just like and it's said. like a day trip. You know, you can you can stay in Amsterdam and then just take take a train uh, to uh, to Utrecht every day and explore, or better yet, take your hotel in Utrecht actually and then just visit Amsterdam when you feel like it. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. visit the rest of the country because Utrecht is really in the center, and uh, and then you have in the east, man, you have all those cities: uh, Deventer, Stolle in the north, Groningen, Maastricht in the south, which is is almost like French uh, uh, Belgium. It's it's really it's that's like completely surrounded by Belgium, mm. Germany, Luxembourg is close by. So yeah, it, it's uh, there is so much more than Amsterdam. Do you, do you know, uh, you might not know this, but uh, being, du but like, do Dutch people generally like Americans coming over? They're like, hey, Americans, yeah, yeah. tourists, yeah. The, the Dutch, the Dutch, I think the Dutch love Americans because I think we're really, uh, we really love the enthusiasm. Um, and <laughs> I, I think we also really, we look up to Americans a bit because, I mean, we are, I think from mainland Europe, uh, one of the most Anglo-Saxon, I think. <laughs> I mean, apart from, I mean, of course, uh, Ireland and, and Britain are way more um, America focused. But I think apart from those, we are most, uh, I think, yeah, we look up to America the most and have best relationships as well, I believe, with the United yeah. States. If that's just what I, from what I think, maybe there's a, but yeah, um, yeah so absolutely come to the United States, you'll be open with, uh, with wide open arms. And uh, yeah. Oh, great. Ruben, thanks a ton for coming on. And I look forward to seeing you here in person in just a couple months. Yeah, fun. thank you. Wonderful. I uh, can't wait to, to see everything there. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. See you. Bye.